Uh, good evening. My name is Brad Blitz. I am the head of the Department of Education, Practice and Society here in the Institute of Education. I'd very much like to welcome you on behalf of the department and on behalf of the Institute. Uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, represent the university on this occasion. Um, I should add, first of all, and I always feel this actually cuts into the substance, and that's why we're here tonight, but a couple of points of housekeeping. Um, and that is that uh, please tweet. Uh, we have a hashtag. The Twitter hashtag is hashtag future of FE. Um, so please, uh, if you are active on social media, everyone would appreciate it. And second, we are not expecting a fire drill, although I've already experienced two um, fires, I should say, since I've been here in, in just uh, six months. Um, so please take to the doors over there should you hear the alarm. Um, so a bit of background. It was my predecessor as head of department, um, Professor David Guile, who worked with Dame uh, Ruth Silver and with Ricky McMenny, who cannot be here this evening, uh, but who's president and chair of FETL. And together, they established a professorship here at the IOE. And this was a particularly innovative uh, effort. Um, and it shouldn't be innovative in as far as the IOE has had a long commitment to further education. But nonetheless, they were able to carve out a professorship, which Martin assumed. And together, they were able to advance uh, further thinking about the further education system, the process, they were able to champion the sector um, and promote it to students and to the wider, uh, wider community. And many of you will already be aware of what Martin has brought to the role and to the institute, um, both as a result of his extensive experience in the sector and his uh, previous training as well, I should add, his training in the armed forces. His Professorship has been encapsulated in two public lectures, uh, which have been filmed. The first was delivered in February 2018, uh, and which was really about defining the FE sector. Tonight, we're going to hear more about the future of FE. And I'm sure many of us will be very keen to understand that FE will indeed have a future. That's something which many of us in the Institute have been keen to ensure is protected and is further advocated by this government and hopefully future governments, I should, I should note. There will be time for questions and answers further to Martin's lecture. Uh, but first of all, I would like to note that tonight marks the launch of the Federal Archive, which we will be hosting here in the IOE library, the best library of education in Europe and one of the best in the world. And so I'm going to turn to Dame Ruth, who's going to tell, tell us a bit more about the archive, um, the move to the IOE, and what this constitutes for those of us who are committed to the future of higher education and further education. And afterwards, you'll be able to take a look at some of the materials from the archive and, of course, uh, continue the dialogue over drinks. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn to Dame Ruth, who will tell us about the Federal Archive. Good evening, colleagues. It's, it's really nice to see you, and I've got my very best friend with me. Um, Jill is the Deputy Chair of FETL, and she is standing in for Ricky, who had uh, an accident sliding down the stairs, and is getting very, very sore all over, so please have some sympathy. So. Um, You'll remember this as well. Nearly seven years ago, Jill and I had the audacity to walk through the doors of this place and say, we've got a smashing idea. We would like to fund not only a professorship, but also to fund fellowships so that our folks could come from our sector and our system and get the support of this number one uh, institution in the world, because that actually was what the IOE was, and it's why we chose it to support our colleagues uh, in taking some time off from the daily grind and spending some time thinking, because FETL is about the leadership of thinking. And um, the reception was very warm indeed. Uh, um, they were surprised, really shocked that we did this, but, but they, were, they, were, they were good about it. And Joe may say a bit more about that. Um, 
We chose, as I've said, uh, uh, IOE because it's education, but because of its reputation worldwide. And we'd had experience in the past at some different behaviours from this part of uh, the university. So, for example, we discovered a very old uh, staff training college for FE, which had been closed down by government cuts some time before, um, uh, had, had boxes of wet papers in its basement. Um, and uh, we, we were approached here and we had a joint uh, project in uh, um, rescuing those and bringing them into the archive of the Institute of Education. So that was a, 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 the seed, I think, of what we're launching this evening. Um, and we also knew the reputation of actually the few staff at that time who were involved in vocational education. So very delighted to, to, to do that and to, um, to surprise their souls. You can't imagine how surprised I was when I had a contact uh, last summer from the Institute uh, saying we would love to archive fetal material. Fetal finishes its seven year um, tour of service uh, in July this year. We were only set up for seven years and we are near the end of that. And we had a program called the end game. And number one in the end game was how do we archive this material? So to receive a phone call and an email from Francesca was at the back of the room saying, we would love to archive your materials. Um, will you come and talk to us? So I did. And of course, Francesca had learned that FETL is the only think tank ever, ever to be dedicated to FE. And so rather than have to scout around many, uh, many organisations to find out works on FE in, in its system, um, they were able to find it in ours. So I can't believe it, actually, really, because we were struggling about how we would find an archive to do this. And not only that, I mean, Francesca enabled an introduction to the British Library, who have been and knocked on our door as well, to archive our, uh, uh, our films and videos and so on. It's a terrific seven-year um, circle, really, for us knocking on the door, surprising you, to being surprised by the fact that you want to take all our work and it's all there. <coughs> So I want to thank IOE, Francesca in particular, for this institution, not just for, for that, but for working with us on the other things, supporting our fellows when, uh, when they came here and um, making you know, Mal Mal Martin as welcome as I think they did. Martin, you'll maybe say more about that. So my thanks. You'll know where to look in future if you're looking for federal documents from the past because they'll be here and at the British Library, of course. So we're uh, launching it. We're really pleased to do that. And we're also very, very, very grateful to do that. Um, I'm introducing uh, Jill, who, of course, was the liaison person with the IOE all the time it's been going on. OK. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Um, can you hear me? I've got the, yes, good. Um, Ruth talked about seven years ago when FETL was set up. Um, and I think Ruth described what we felt was needed by talking about the, the further education sector as being under-researched, under-thought about, under-understood. Um, and we wanted to do something about that. And uh, we began with three essential ideas, that we would support individuals who had preoccupations, things that they wanted to find out more about, by helping them get the time to do that and to write about those. Um, equally to support organisations who are involved in research in further education and skills. And also we had the idea that we wanted to create a chair, a professorial chair, the first of its kind in further education and skills. And as Ruth says, the Institute of Education was the natural place to come. Um, and we talked to Chris Husbands, who was then the director, and um, David Guile, um, and uh, they really understood the vision and were very on board with helping us take it forward. And this led to the appointment of Martin Dole, who had just left Association of Colleges as the first ever professor of further education and skills. And in a sense, that was the start. And this is the punctuation mark. This is the ending of Martin's um, work in that role. Um, so it really is the opportunity for me to thank um, the Institute of Education, UCL, and of course Martin for all the work he's done as FETL Chair. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy his lecture. He did say to me, you shouldn't be thanking me before I've actually said anything, Jill, but I am doing. Well, thanks very much indeed, uh, Jill and Ruth and Brad for the introduction. This is the second of my public lectures and effectively is my valedictory lecture as the past 
uh, Fettel Professor of Leadership in Further Education and Skills. And I do feel have been extraordinarily fortunate to have had the opportunity to be here over the last three years uh, in that role. In it, I'll aim to draw together reflections and thinking from a variety of sources. Um, it's one of the facets of having more than one career. You, you draw from lots of places. Uh, but I think I can say without fear of contradiction that it's unlikely in the next week or month that you will hear a lecture on FE that features an underlying Hegelian approach, albeit with some implied criticism from Popper. He's the old bloke on the right. Uh, a, a member of the Bank of England Monetary Committee, Jonathan Haskell. Dominic Cummings' favourite military theorist, Colonel John Boyd, a former director of special forces, and a number of distinguished UCL academics, including my colleague Ken Spores. And I don't, and he looks very dapper here and up here. I have to say, I don't know if anyone else sees the resemblance with Hegel, but uh, Ken's not quite as grumpy as Hegel. Uh, but before I start this journey uh, through the influences drawn from across my teaching, military and FE careers and the reflection I've had over the last three years, I'd like to thank two, first two key enablers. First, Fettel, led by Dame Roof and Ricky Menemi and supported by Jill for having had the faith to invest in the first ever Chair of Leadership in Further Education and Skills and for their personal support to me in uh, giving me the opportunity to, to read, think, and reflect so widely over the last few years. Second, to my colleagues at IOE, and most particularly in the Post 14 Center for Education and Work, whose groundbreaking work on further education and, and social ecosystems led by Ken Spores and Anne Hodgson, and that by Paul Granger, who's in the audience this evening on local, local labor market intelligence, has guided and informed much of the thinking that you'll hear this evening. Uh, this lecture also draws on a series of round tables that I convened as Fettel Professor uh, that brought together academics from within and beyond IOE and brought also together leaders from across FE to consider some of the issues covered this evening. And I think actually that's one of the things I'm most proud of having achieved over the time as chair is to brought together the two worlds of practitioners and leaders in the sector with academics who think and write about the sector and wider academics from across UCL. And I think it's one of the, one of the great benefits of the IOE folding into UCL is that access to a wider academic community that touches and affects further education in my case. And the publication following from that is in the Fettel Archive. You can go and find one whenever you want, should anyone ever want to read it in the future. Uh, this section lecture, though, builds upon the first one that Brad laid out, uh, some of the, the thinking was there. And it was concerned with what I perceive to be problems with the ways in which FE has been defined. My conclusion in that first lecture is that it's defined as much from, from the first time the term was used, the beginning of the last century. Further education has been defined by what it's not rather than what it definitely is. So as per the Wikipedia definition, it's education not delivered in a school or a university. The breadth of that provision that classified, that's become, to become classified as further education grew as the century progressed with the addition of anything that didn't fit else, neatly elsewhere, often encompassing students and communities that hadn't been otherwise well served. The consequence of that definition, by default, was a lack of agency in providers and in students in further education that has allowed policymakers to address the sector partially and episodically, but most particularly without continuity or con coherence, picking on bits of the sector to reform at times and in ways which weren't constant and didn't actually give a sense of direction. My suggested remedy was to encourage FE providers to set their own course to develop strategies that were longer lasting and less likely to be blown hither and thither by frequently changing policy. The underlying means of informing such longer lasting policy was to identify their core purpose and to set values that would enable them to determine, following a writer Richard Rummelt's analysis, as much of what, as what they would not do as what they would. Colleges and FE providers have almost been, will do anything, not determining strategy by saying what was not for them. But the obvious rejoinder 
uh, from some of those who attended the lecture and beyond was that it was all very easy for me to take this lofty position when I wasn't working now in the sector, uh, but not so easy for them to enact in the face of the dire funding cuts faced by all in further education, and they have been dire. This, this uh, diagram used frequently to describe the reduction in investment in colleges and in further education more generally, at the same time as funding in universities has been on an upward swing. I think that criticism could, to some extent, be answered by my reference to core and contingent purpose in the lecture. Uh, but more to the point for this evening, I think the fiscal climate is changing. The attention that's been given to further education since 2015, when I think the spending settlement in that year was most likely, is most likely to be seen in the future as a, a watershed moment, uh, bringing to, to the end a progressive disinvestment in further education that have pushed the sector close to what Alison Wolfe said was the precipice. I think that period of disinvestment is coming to an end. It, it doesn't feel that way now, but I think it, my optimism is that the future will be more about choices. And this there won't be another periodic phase of passing interest in FE. I think the externalities, Brexit, all else, and consistent priority accorded to FE in a succession of plans, some of them you see listed up here, and reports will lead up to a substantive change in priorities in funding in, further edu in education more generally. I, there's more work to be done, and I pay tribute to my successor at the Association of Colleges, David Hughes, for the great work he's done around Love Our Colleges and actually bringing this more to the fore, and that needs to go on. But if my optimism is justified, by the way, funding will swing in the next decade, the next decade will be about as much about choices and of how the money is applied by policymakers and how it's accessed by providers. My worry in this regard is that when the f if and when the funding taps begin to be turned on, FE providers reflecting that lack of agency that I identified in my first lecture will simply ride the funding wave again, rather than having that distinct sense of mission and direction. And that policymakers introducing the funding will put conditions on that funding and shape the funding in a way which is likely to lead to incoherent policy and again, policy that doesn't persist over time. It's in that spirit that I've approached, I think somewhat potentially, somebody talking about the future of further education. Uh, and predictably, I'm not alone in looking at it. It's the start of a new de decade. And just as we did in 2010, to look at the world of colleges 2020, commissions are springing up all over the place. And one, the Independent Commission of the College of the Future. I'm sure that David Hughes and his team will actually do a much better job than we did in 2010 with our publication. But in looking at the predictions that we did make in 2010, I was struck not by what we got wrong, but what we missed. There was not a hint of a mention, for instance, of AI, nor was there anything about Brexit. And an employer levy was roared for apprenticeships was ruled out as being much too radical and threatening to employers for a Labour government to undertake, much less a Conservative government. So how much did we know in 2010? The key point, though, I think, is that the predictions were too specific and drawn too closely from existing pressures and trends. So in the immortal words of Yogi Berra, never make predictions, especially about the future. And so I don't intend to make predictions this evening. Rather, I'm going to look at a, a series, I think, of what I believe to be fundamental issues that will face leaders in further education, both policymakers and providers, over the next 10 years. Arguably, they've faced us for the previous 10 years as well. These are issues are most often presented as dilemmas or dichotomies. I'll argue rather that they've been and will continue to be ever-present dualities that give rise to inevitable tensions. And the way those tensions are or are not settled can be disruptive and destabilizing if they're not acknowledged and worked at. Analyzing and resolving the dilemmas is possible, I think, for a, pro a process, the dialectical process, which I borrow from Hegel and enlightening thinking more generally, whereby a hypothesis and an opposing antithesis are resolved in a new synthesis, where an absolute ideal state is always modified in reality. 
I adopt this approach, I have to say, I hope with some humility and trepidation, based only on my undergraduate studies of philosophy of education in a building that's got real philosophers of education in the room. But I do think this idea of a dialectic is a useful device in this context. For too long, it seems to me that policy in further education has swung between thesis and antithesis like a pendulum, never finding a constant sense of direction. That's the inconstant and partial policy that I referred to earlier. But, but more simply, it seems to me, FE seems to have faced and will continue to face that's a series, if you want to put it rather than more pretentiously and pompously about dilemmas, a series of either ors. And I'll say that those either ors are not either ors, actually. They are constantly present tensions that we need to address. Thinking how to avoid them will allow us, I hope, to move forward in a more purposeful and consistent way over the next decade. I've selected these as my four dilemmas tonight. But as you can say, the text, the grayed out text indicates they have ever and always will be interrelated. And there could have been any more numbers of ten tensions or dilemmas that I could have identified. But before I get to the dilemmas themselves, I, I need, I think, to look at a, a, identify another dualism whose resolution, I think, will set the conditions for what happens in further education at, at the macro level. A shorthand, I've called this the post-market economy. The term captures, I think, much re recent writing about problems in free market economies. In what I think is a, often a lazy way, this is referred to a crisis in neoliberalism, meeting... Uh, meaning and meriting or arguing for a full-scale return to plan-led direction in the economy and the, heart, the entire removal of market mechanisms. More considered analysis, analysis is, though, available, and this more considered thinking is already having an influence on policy. For instance, Westlake and Haskell's Capitalism Without Capital charts the rise of importance of intangible assets in modern economies and the associated consequences. And you can also see that Alliteration is very much in vogue at the moment. Such intangible assets can, can scale quickly around an, ire, an idea or process. They have rapid scalability. But without needing assets like buildings, manufactured products, or factories, these businesses don't have assets in the same way that they, and when they fail, they have sunkenness. They just disappear from the... the, the, the the, the landscape. Think pay Facebook, fintech, and in key respects, Amazon here, but also franchise businesses like Peloton. The same qualities make such businesses very difficult to regulate and tax, but the final two qualities seem key to me in relation to further education. Spillover and synergy, which induce knowledge-rich companies in related sectors to group together spatially the phenomenon known as agglomeration. Think, the obvious one, Silicon Valley. But as knowledge-rich and highly productive industries agglomerate, most often in and around cities, other areas are left behind. An issue that is the, at the core of many policy concerns and the current buzz, buzz phrase, levelling up. In the congested geography of the south of England, for instance, these areas also can be very close to one another. Think carrot topping in the real fens north of Cambridge with a large siege seasonal immigrant workforce being only 20 miles from Silicon Fen, the biotech hub the other side of the city. And think of the increasingly automated Tilbury docks with high levels of deprivation being less than 20 miles from Tech City, just a little way from here. For an increasing number of economists, such phenomenon argue for a more interventionist state. But critically, given the development of modern economies and things like the rise of intangibles, marked by rapid change and subject to global forces that induce new levels of complexity and interdependence, the broad consensus amongst these writers is against a return to centralised planning in detail. But the question remains, if we're going to have a strategic state, is how and where will it intervene? The influence of such thinking is most, for me, very clear in the government's industrial strategy, which hasn't been withdrawn, published in 2017, with its emphasis on things like opportunity areas and regional development. And for FE, 
It's almost ubiquitous references to technical education and skills as key elements in driving up productivity. Beyond these direct references, how does this thinking affect further education? Well, the prominence of the market and mar primary market behaviour competition in further education has been much written about and commented. The rise of the market in FE and, FE and between FE providers and between FE providers and schools and universities, sometimes FE against the world, is most often associated with the 1992 Act in which colleges were incorporated into self-governing bodies. As Ken Spores and Ewart Keep have pointed out, though, the market in further education was never as pure as some critiques implied. Use, using Ewart's phrase, what has emerged is a series of quasi-markets with fluctuating but nonetheless ever-present intervention by government agencies like the, the Learning and Skills Council. Equally, as Bill Bailey, the historian of further education up to incorporation, has pointed out, the competition wasn't entirely new and invented in 1992, there having been a good deal of competition between colleges particularly and providers in urban areas. Looking more closely at further education and more recently, <coughs> recent events seem to reflect that macro view that we're moving further away from a pure market in further education. The process of area reviews initiated in 2015 was in effect, in effect a direct refutation of free market econo economics, which would have argued for financially stressed and failing colleges to have been allowed to just dis dissolve into the ground, with the market reproviding what would have been lost through their demise. Instead, a review process was initiated with £600 million of restructuring from government recognising the disordered failure of a cornerstone of many local education and employment ecosystems, FE colleges, could not be allowed to occur. Likewise, the apprenticeship levy through which the government takes money off employers as a hypothecated tax and then hands it back to them, telling them what to spend it on, doesn't seem to me to be the epitome of Milton Friedman's free market economy. And the latest development, the Insolvency Act and the Education Administration, is particularly interesting in terms, as far as my argument for a post-market settlement goes. The Act does introduce a measure of moral hazard for college governing bodies, but it's resulted in a special and particular form of administration where the provision is protected, if not the institution making that provision. In this, in many other ways, government seems to me to be wanting to have its cake and eat it around the market. So just as the outcome of our area reviews was incentivised by the restructuring fund rather than being directed top-down, the likely outcome of most cases of ed education and administration will be the managed dispersal of college assets to other colleges or the creation of a Phoenix college which rises from the ashes. Similarly, whilst the, the levy is not pure economic markets, pure, pure market economics, strong elements of the market retained with providers competing to service the needs of employers when they have their money back. The way ahead then is likely to be a melange, I think, of apparently dichotomous behaviours, which brings me to my first dilemma. Competition or collaboration as a subset of the market or non-market approach to further education. As I've suggested here uh, a couple of years ago, and as, as you at Keep, is argued more cogently and perhaps persuasively, competition is still the predominant mode of behaviour within further education. At the same time, though, collaboration is increasingly being encouraged. And this is a speech from Anne Milton, the skills minister at the time, to the AOC conference in 2018, reinforced around a lot of the rhetoric around area reviews and other types of initiatives presently running. So collaboration between FE providers, FE providers and schools and universities and providers are being employed, are being, is being sought. And I think it extends beyond best practice sharing providers. So how then to resol resolve that tension between collaborate and compete uh, when performance measures and the need for greater coordination without a, dis a re return to detailed enforced collaboration from top-down direction? When I worked with a group of 
colleges in the West Midlands, the Further Education Productivity and Skills Group, we came up with five propositions that needed to be addressed. And these are those five propositions for you. And I have to say, with apologies to a blend of sources in terms of where, where they came from, including, at the end, Darwin, because Darwinian behaviour is still pretty much uppermost within further education. Um, if I look at these just quickly, I, funds have been scarce within further education. Um, and as I'll pick up a moment in terms of specialists in general provision, the generic low-level provision, provisions being an outcome. And also, I'll address the second bullet within my final dilemma, simple and complicated. Likewise, the second proposition is particularly relevant to the apparent dilemma between being both local and national. I think the third proposition is particularly interesting in relation to role differentiation. Here, I think there's potential for useful learning from across the UK, where greater role differentiation has been retained, with colleges in Scotland having prime responsibility for full-time technical and professional <coughs> education from entry level to level five, with the market and apprenticeships being more ascribed, and geographical separation between regional colleges having been more, e more fully defined. Similar geographical separation is achieved in Wales and Northern Ireland. And other education systems across the world, indeed, have achieved greater role definition differentiation between providers than exist within England. But as I shall argue in relation to geography, the scale of, geog in the, scale of the enterprise in England and history make transferring uh, lessons from the other nations to England a tricky business, particularly if a measure of competition and hence choice is to be retained and we're not going to return to top-down direction in detail and enforce differentiation. Trust is also an issue that I'll return to in my final dilemma. Suffice to say at this point, and to argue that it takes time to establish and can't be enforced. But it's most likely a result from incentivization that recognizes that further education is part of a complex social ecosystem that is easy to disrupt, but less easy to shape. In this regard, I would commend the ELVET, East London Vocational Education and Training Work, undertaken by colleagues in the post-14 centre. Uh, as I've noted, the propositions regarding collaboration uh, and competition have resonance in the remaining dilemmas. And in particular, pr Proposition 2 and 3 bear directly upon local and national and specialist and generalist. At this point, when I was putting together the lecture in detail, I realised that each of those dilemmas could have actually look to justify a 45 min minute lecture in itself. Uh, so in the next two lemmas, I, dilemmas, I will as a consequence speed on, using, lapsing into a degree of shorthand that those that are not associated with further education might think some of the conclusions jump out of the ether. Uh, if they do, then please do call me up in questions and I'll try and answer in greater detail. The second of those dilemmas is local or national. I think that the meeting uh, place-based needs is a powerful means by which colleges might collaborate more together and independent trainers, tra training providers also. And most colleges in particular would see responding to local need as being central to their raison d'etre, at the core of their mission. It's in this respect colleges and other FE providers, I think, differ from most, if not absolutely all universities, notwithstanding the recent attention given to the civic role of universities in the recent commission. It's my submission that FE colleges in particular are institutions that are inherently for a place where universities, <coughs> though increasingly respectful of the effect they have on their local communities, are primarily of the place. The University of Manchester is the, ma the university located in Manchester. It's not the university for Manchester in the way that Manchester College is the college for Manchester. It was not always so. At the turn of the last century, great met metropolitan universities in Manchester and Birmingham were established with a clear intent to serve the mercantile interests of those cities. But those universities have grown way beyond that role now, with their curriculum being driven by global, national and regional interests, much more than their immediate environs. I should also say, but the interest of the academy the creation of new knowledge. 
the establishment of a UCL, the establishment of a UCL campus in East London might be seen as a move to counter this trend. And I think it's to be celebrated on that grounds, but it will draw its students, partners and influences from a much wider area than East London, if for no other reason through scale and reach. Uh, and I think the degree of instrumentalism inherent in serving a place is an uneasy match for the idea of in academic autonomy and this, the sense of a university being a university. And I'd argue for other reasons that schools are not a, for a place in the same way as colleges. FE colleges primarily because those schools have little flexibility in establishing their own curriculum mix up to the age of 16 to meet particular local needs in the way colleges do. But colleges are charged specifically with developing a curriculum mix that meets local needs. But as that Amanda Spielman uh, recently argued in launching the at college the, the Ofsted annual report, some don't do this job as well as they should, in her opinion. There is, though, I think a very powerful counterfactual. And this came was expressed by Joe Burgess on Twitter. Uh, relating to choice. What Joe Co Joe's comment, I think, points to is the potential for a curriculum that's restricted to meeting only the needs of local jobs, restricts the choices that young people can make if they want to follow technical and professional courses. And this is a, an issue, I think, also that's been brought to the fore in the rollout of T-levels, where the absence of a local employer in the required sector prevents a core college or a provider for making provision in that area. So if there are no engineering firms near Boston College, it says that young people in Boston can't be engineers because they can't undertake a T-level there because there is no work placement. This antithesis, I think, so you've had the thesis for place, and then there's the antithesis, you can't just be for place, has a danger, I think, turning a fa fascination with the local market, it place becomes destiny. Your destiny is defined where you are brought up, and the only courses you can do are those related to your locality. And that, I th in turn, I think has hints of social injustice, whereby those students choosing to follow the academic route have a wide offer that does not lim limit their mobility, whilst those students following vocational courses who are disproportionately from more disadvantaged backgrounds don't have that same choice. So where's the synthesis then between those two tensions? I think it's actually in one of Ofsted's current favorite words, intent. And in fundamentally recognizing what colleges and further education providers do is not simply provide training, but is also about wider education for life. Arguably, the balance between broad education and training may shift across the lifespan with broad education predominating up into age 18, and a shift occurring <coughs> after age 18. Um, but it's not as simple as that even. With those returning to, to study later in life, uh, often requiring a broad introduction either to re-engage or to address prior underachievement. The key thing is achieving the necessary synthesis is for Ofsted and policymakers and providers to recognize and respect the purpose and intent behind the courses offered and to act accordingly. Beyond that, uh, I think that a key observation is that in a non-authoritarian system, which is what we still do have, it's students that have demands and employers that have needs. The most that colleges and others can do is move one closer to the other. Hence, Somewhere like Bridgewater College sitting next to Hinkley B Power Station development, uh, the new development, should properly be expected to offer courses that meet the needs of that industry. But there is every reason also for the college to offer performing arts courses if they can do so to a high quality, and they do. The need to avoid a simplistic and crude conception of curriculum planning was made strongly by Alison Wolfe in her contribution to an Education Select Committee last year.
in making this argument, though, I'm conscious I've actually ended up with a dualism that's m as much about being student-centric and being employer-centric as between local and national in geographical terms. So to return to a more direct tension between national and local, it's worth looking at devolution, not least in the context of that current interest in levelling up between areas. For its champions, devolution offers a means by which skills provision can mo more effectively meet the needs of local communities with further education being shaped by local authorities and the new metro mayors. Such local authorities could in prospect have a much greater role in shaping the offer in FE in their jurisdictions and could, in the process, potentially off exercise tighter control and direction than is possible from Whitehall. Would that geography was so simple. Unfortunately, or fortunately, or just as it is, the congested geography in England uh, and the boundaries of local authorities are not a good guide to shaping FE provision. Nor, obviously, do the boundaries of combined authorities cover the whole of the country, with colleges sitting between or astride boundaries <coughs> serving multiple authorities. And that's what I've tried to illustrate here. A phenomenon seen in the Northwest with colleges in the M6 corridor looking both east and west, as is in the case of colleges around London who are meeting around the needs defined by the capital as much as by the town in which they're located. So density is a factor in balancing local and wider needs. So too is scale, with the process of agglomeration becoming increasingly apparent in what are almost a, a series of city-states. Issues and scale of density also, I think, make lessons from the home nations difficult to apply in England. But to level up left-behind places clearly plays to further education strengths in its place-based role. The need to level up is indeed acknowledged but as one of the authors of Capitalism Without Capital has, has, has acknowledged, how this is done is less well understood and sometimes prays, fall, falls prey to magical thinking, hence his reference to Hintzelman here. In his suggested remedies, Stephen Westlake comes up with a series of four key areas, invest in cities, intracity, transport, and devolved R&D, invest in skills, and invest in links between towns and cities in order that the, the ecosystem begins to develop in a more balanced ways. But I think also, he makes the point, some of those towns are not capable of being linked with the new agglomerated cities and will have to have a future of their own that needs to be forged and built. In terms of what government's doing, if you read the town's prospectus, there's a... We, there's a uncanny reference and kind of consonance with what Westlake was saying, which is hardly surprising since he was a special advisor to Greg Clark in the previous government. But following my logic here, um, is particular interest is, I think, the observation that the town's difference. And then following this logic, the synthesis that a college serving a me medium-sized town might seek, might, might turn out to be very different than that being sought by a large college served by a well, large city served by multiple of colleges so a single town college is going to be different and actually seek a different balance between local and national than a college working in a big urban environment like london this differentiation adds to what i think is the key facet, facet behind a synthesis between local and national and that's a more nuanced conception of localism than this simplistic view that ofsted's offering presently acknowledging the complexities involved and thinking about it in ecosystem terms that's not rigid and proprietary is I, I think essential to good policy making as is what Ken Spores has said is a combinational view of the, the economy and it, of which further education is but one part. In terms of providers, I'll go back to my first lecture, it's essential that colleges and all providers know how, who they serve and why they're serving them. And now, really briefly, is a, a rush through on generalists or specialists, which could, again, have a whole lecture on itself. Uh, there's a certain irony here as well. The most colleges are most often referred to as general further education colleges, but nonetheless, they get criticised for making too much general provision uh, and not enough specialist provision. 
Uh, specialists can sometimes apply to colleges that serve particular constituencies like the Royal National College for Bli the Blind in Hereford and or for the Deaf in Doncaster, or delivering only to adults in the case of City Lit in Northern College. But in the context of this evening's discussion, I'm addressing the, the charge that there is too much low level and generic provision in further education. A charge that conflates specialism with, a, with level of education in a way that, that Mark Dorr of ALP, I think is quite rightly entrenchedly argued, is lazy thinking. In some industries, level two, for instance, is the key working level in a UK con context, in industries like hospitality and retail. To pretend it was otherwise is to just not confront reality as it exists today. There is, though, a strong consensus, which I'd support, that in order to become more productive, we need higher level skills in these industries as much as in others. Despite this consensus, as I argued earlier, the pressure on funding and a range of other factors, not least underperformance in the pre-16 schooling system, have understandably driven providers, and most particularly colleges, toward level two provision on a safe haven basis that rewards volume, minimizes cost, and reduces exposure to changes in the market. Provision at level three, and particularly levels four and five, is inher inherently harder to deliver, requiring expensive facilities, more expert staff, and being more subject to fluctuating demand, fluctuating demand that's unpredictable. How then to resolve the need for higher level and more specialist provision against a tendency to lower level, jack of all trades, master of none? characterizations. For a time, the government's preferred strategy seemed not to, to, to be to work with existing providers in this respect, but instead to insert new institutions into the landscape, like the National Colleges of High Speed Rail and Coding. But a recent review of government, it by, of a government by itself has demonstrated inserting new institutions into a pre-existing and complex ecosystem is problematic. Whether, whether those new institutions are UTCs or the new national colleges. The alternative instead is to work with existing institutions to achieve a synthesis between generalist and specialist provision. This is a point that seems to be accepted in the, pr the approach being taken to establishing the new institutes of technology and to have been implicitly accepted through the area review process. It acknowledges that students at lower levels are less likely to travel in order to access learnings, necessitating a near general offer and a more distant specialist centre that are shared between groups of colleges and providers. But in an echo of previous dilemmas, such an approach requires a measure of collaboration and sharing and, what, and identifying what works well in a lar large urban area which may not be applicable to a, a small town with a single college. It also recognises a need to, rec to, to identify specialist capability and a capacity by both providers themselves and commissioners of provision to recognise where specialism exists or can be built. There's a whole literature relating to organisational specialisation, which I had the joy of reading. Most of, most of which, I must confess, left me cold and completely unpersuaded as to how it could apply to further education. The best alternative I came up with I found, is actually in one of the few colleges still led by an engineer that identifies, and he went to identify various dimensions of specialization and the way that typically an engineer would do that. Looking at dimensions of specialization, not concentrating only on what the college does most of, but actually I look, looking for peaks of expertise from various dimensions. And as I say, he wasn't a, an engineer, so he had to put it down to a scoring system which was uh, very useful. The uh, chair is here today, so he knows what I'm talking about. His principal, who's the most logical person I've ever seen, but it can be reasonably difficult at points. Um, and I think that that relates, I think, br brings us to a pragmatic and practical, or pragmatic and prim uh, pragmatic synthesis. So to the final dilemma, complicated or simple? Um, from all I've said, particularly those who are not deeply involved in further education, the conclusion, I think reasonable, is FE is sodding complicated. Um, and that's 
by far the most frequent expression or, or in opinion that I'd received when I was at the Association of Colleges when I engaged with ministers, MPs, and assorted policy wonks who had a look at this from time to time. That further education is complex, and arguably more complex than in any other education sector is hardly surprising, given the range of constituencies it serves, from age 14 to age 99, from entry to recovery, uh, sorry, for entry and recovery level to mastery, from service industries to manufacturing, and from local to national and everything in between. In, the echo, in an echo of my first lecture, everything, in fact, that does not fall within the ambit of a school or university, and some things that do fall within the ambit of a school or a university. Difficulties arise, though, when efforts are made to simplify further education, resulting most often, most often in failed reforms that are sometimes brutally simplistic, resulting in unfairness and inefficiency. Rereading re one of Hegel's most trenchant critics, Karl Popper, the philosopher, served to remind me this urge to simplify is, as Václav Havel pointed out in his preface to the Open Society and its enemies, fundamentally authoritarian. It also runs counter to current thinking on how complex systems should be navigated. That thinking is informed by writers like Lorentz and Gleick that I referred to in my first lecture concerning non-linearity and chaos within complex systems. A recent study, which is, I've taken some uh, quotes from, by researchers at Newcastle University concerning funding in, and commissioning in complexity draws upon this thinking. This undue wish to simplify in a way which actually doesn't as to assist in delivery. But if further education is complicated and attempts to simplify it, mistaken, where is the dilemma or tension that is resolving? So I should, at this point, pick up on particularly this thing about unpredictably predictability and path dependence, because I think they're important, I think, in, as I move forward about how we should, in future, set policy relating to further education. But if it is so complicated, and attempts at simplification are so mistaken, where's the dilemma or, or the tension that needs resolving? Just don't, don't we just accept it's complicated? The tension, I think, comes in seeking to bring cohesion to policy making and delivery in further education. Such coherence, I think, requires some degree of consensus and understanding of broader objectives so that a r recognized direction of travel can be a, a achieved and a degree of alignment put in place between all the various providers. And by that and nature, such alignment must have a degree of clarity and simplicity to it. In the recommendations, the Newcastle researchers <coughs> emphasized the, import the importance of relationship building and trust between actors in complex systems, underlining Ken Spohr's pleas for a combinational approach. While I think that such trust and relationship building is critical, I don't think it goes far enough. It's frankly too woolly, particularly in terms of accountability and adaptation. In looking for a broader synthesizing approach, this is where I upset Jill and I fall back on my former military career and my studies at King's College and at the Joint Services and Command Staff College to one of my former bosses there, Sir Graham Lamb. General Lamb's departure speech, which can be found on the internet, was in, entitled In Command, Out of Control. Uh, now, in reading the speech, and if you read it, what he's actually talking about is being in command but not in control. Um, and it's that characterization that's also been picked up by writers like Malcolm Gladwell. Both Gladwell and General Lamb were drawing upon a strain of thought that stretches back to the 19th century military philosopher who was schooled in dialectics, Clausewitz, and forward through von Moltke the Elder, the guy in the middle, looking stern, the head of the, the Prussian general staff in the Franco-German wars later that same century. I uh, should mention here, General Lamb would no doubt laugh like a drain that I put, put and linked him to Klaus Fitz and von Moltke, laugh and then probably thump me. Uh, but the common threads are clear, to me at least, 
as Clausewitz demonstrated, the geometric and detailed planning that was in vogue up to the end of the 18th century was no match the com for the complexity of war, war waged by nation states. War is and in continues to be inherently the domain of complexity generated by unpredictably arri unpredictability arising from the clash of countless individual human wills. In modern terms, and I echo what I've said before, it is non-linear and most nearly chaotic and always will be. It was von Moltke who actually took Clausewitz's thinking and resolved it into a command philosophy to bring some sense of direction beyond sheer overwhelming force to this complex system which was unpredictable. He also gave us that much misapplied quote, no plan survives contact with the enemy. A system that was derived was known as Alf in German as Auftragstaktik, mission type orders. That's not being involved in detailed planning, but actually thinking about the, 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 the intent between behind any action, the why we were doing, the higher purpose. This then supports conversations about what needs to be achieved, the near return objective. As we were taught at the staff college, or I taught at the staff college, 80% of the planning should be on the why and the what. 20% should be on the how. And leave it to others to interpret how to get things done. So not in detail, the how. In practice, this translates into much greater consideration being given to the initial travel. That point about the first conditions being so important and ex acknowledging path dependence is impossible to predict further forward. <coughs> There's also resonance in other elements of our track tacti tactic that are also often missed in the military and elsewhere. The need for trust and space for learning as events unravel. If you are interested in more, learning more of this, then I'd recommend a recent book by my former head of department at King's College, uh, the magnum opus on this subject. But coming back more directly to further education and to the simple and complex dilemma, the synthesis, I think, is in the marriage of a clear conceptual framework that imparts direction with an ability to, to react in detail as events unfold without losing direction. And what Paul Collier, for instance, identifies as incremental experimentation. And I refer to it as radi radi sort of rapid ad adaptation with a robust framework. Building such a framework depends on more conceptual thought being given to the shape of a reform program, not making them up overnight, as some might argue is the case with the apprenticeship levy and others like the T-level T reform program. I'm not sure fully with the detractors in either case. The levies had roots in the Richard Review and the T-level rollout program as being more prolonged than some would suggest. A better example in this regard of a failed program might be individual learning accounts earlier this century, where rather than the type of incremental experimentation championed by Collier and in effect Popper, a big bang, bang introduction was then followed by abuse within the system and then the wholesale withdrawal of the system. So the goodness was lost in conce what conceptually could have been a strong program. Greater clarity as to guiding intent would have left open the possibility of adjustment and learning without the goodness of the program altogether. And I think that's what we face possibly to lose the, the levy. It needs adjustment within a strong conceptual framework rather than throwing over the side entirely. And here I come to, so clarity and considered simplicity are that which then enables you to get into a program. But you also need to enable agility in the inevitably complex business of implementation. And here I do come to Dominic Cummings' favorite military thinker, Colonel John Boyd, a veteran pilot, fighter pilot of the Korean War, who developed his eponymous OODA loop that Cummings talks about quite often to address the superior performance of MiG jets, Russian MiG, over US aircraft, which he and his colleagues were flying. The sense of the loop, of the loop is that if you are able to observe, orientate yourself, 
decide and act more quickly than your opponent, then you would enjoy information dominance and hence uh, redress all other weaknesses. The OODA loop has been developed further by his disciples, but I have to tell you in military cycles at the Staff College, it was only ever seen as a tactical tool and it needed to be harnessed through a strong strategic design to have any sense. If it's not, it actually becomes an, an ultimately useless and aimless act and react cycle. Now arguably, and I don't want to be controversial here, I don't know if I necessarily believe it, but you might say the Vote Leave campaign had appeared to have a strong overarching design in the take back control mantra within which he operated the OODA loop faster than anyone else. The, the use of data, which was most much remarked upon in the, the Vote Leave campaign, was, uh, is critical into making an OODA loop work. It suggests information and its process into, into action is the key to successful adaptation. In the context of FE and in the context of devolution, that, needs to, that data needs to be local, regional, and national. But as importantly, it needs to be timely. And the rules related to na published national statistics mean that they're, they're ev inevitably backward looking and unduly historical. And I'd commend the work the Association of Colleges have done here in terms of bringing local labor market intelligence and performance data to colleges before they become national statistics so they can react in that OODA loop more quickly than traditional policy would, would have that ha happen. But that action needs, I think, to be at the, the, the level of nearly micro adjustments at critical moments, using nudges instead of massive shoves that we've seen in the past that totally unbalance the system. And it means not seeking to control the system in detail at all times and at all places, but intervening at key points to influence and incentivize action. Uh, I, mean, I, I need to think more about this, and I could speak much more about this, but there's not time to do tonight. So what I will do, and those are the picking up those points, rather that adaptation, more consideration to conceptual basis for policy change, clear identification of the, uh, the guiding intent, then incremental and experimentation through an OODA loop process, but using nudge. The other one, I think, is the final one, is, is about trusted providers. And I do think if we're going to move to a more stable, more effective system. We're going to have to identify trusted providers within our system. The English system in particular is extraordinarily low trust, which is a poor, extraordinarily poor match for complex circumstances. So some concluding thoughts. I do think it's the, the case. Um, first, from the eponymous authors of nudge theory on the fallacy that either a pure market control a or pure market or control mentality will work generally or, I would argue, within further education. Second, that further education is inherently a complex system that operate, operates within a whole set of other complex systems. And I think the operating with such systems requires leaders who are developed and supported, but above all, all tr trusted. And currently, we have a low trust environment, and we have leaders that are not supported, nor necessarily developed into the complexity of the roles that we're placing them. Moreover, such systems can't be led from a single point, whether nationally or locally. Controlling such systems in detail, whether from City Hall, James, or from Whitehall, is doomed to fail, given the dynamics of a modern economy and the need to inform, maintain informed choice in a country like our own. If the system is to remain healthy and deliver successful outcomes to students, communities, employers, competitive behavior between FE providers and leaders will need to be balanced by collaborative behaviors. And in to incentivize such behavior, a more stable system, a greater less level of trust will be required and stability, and needs to be created through a policy framework that combines long-term thinking with short-term agility. Thank you very much.
thank you for that very rich lecture, Martin. Uh, you've given us much to think about. And I, I should add that one of the take-home messages for me, of course, is um, what do we do? Why are we doing it? And are we giving that enough thought? What we heard this evening was a jaunt across the history of ideas from Hegel to Popper to some very contemporary writers. Um, as Martin has set out, this is a highly complex um, place, that is the place of further education, but also the problems of place-based inequalities which are deep-seated, which cannot be easily addressed as a result of the ways in which the economy of this country, and arguably in other places, has been established. And in that context, I think it's, it's interesting that when we talk about the, the underlying economic challenges, it's, it's remarkable that so often we return to this model of Silicon Valley as this place where there was a clustering that came together in a very timely way, um, my own university being a central accelerator for the birth of what is seen as among the most dynamic economies. Um, Britain is different. England is different. The conditions and circumstances we're looking at are very different. And uh, how we grapple with those differences, those very particular, those local differences, those inequalities which have been created both historically and as a result of both the intervention and the withdrawal of the state um, is something that preoccupies many of us, I should say probably all of us, working in this building and you've certainly given us an awful lot to think about there. Um, so with that, I've been urged to nudge you over to one of these chairs so that we can take some questions and comments from our colleagues here. So we have some time for questions uh, and comments. We have one here. Let's take them in, in some batches. Um, I just want to ask when your um, presentation was written, because um, extrapolating from the diagram, the chart that you had, which was a decrease of 20% over the last nine years, I'm assuming that there's going to be an additional 10% decrease over the next five years. Um, and being a pessimist, I wanted to know whether or not you've taken into consideration the change in policy on immigration so that there's going to be a massive reduction in the number of people who have no skills being employed in the UK that are coming from um, uh, uh, other countries, and whether or not your criticism that people were overqualified, uh, well, sorry, weren't receiving sufficient qualifications isn't correct, which is that people are going to need to be less educated so that they can fill those spaces that are being created by this absence of um, unskilled and low-skilled uh, immigration? Um, How do I answer that? It was written this afternoon, um, pretty much. Um, it's been thought about for a lot longer. Um, I kind of, I would refute the view that it's going to fall further from here. I do think there's a, there's a time now that when, I, you know, I, I don't know if it's a renaissance of further education, but if the cards are played well, both by providers and by government now, there is in prospect a, a change in place. I think Brexit, sought, wished or otherwise, is here, is a contextual issue that will reinforce the need for developing our own skills. And I don't say that in, in the sense of being like the Home Secretary putting this as a political point, I just think it is, is a logical point that actually developing skills and allowing people to move on within work and to improve their, their, abili their ability to deliver will come more to the fore. And I don't think I was saying that I want or want to usher in lower level skills. I'm saying that I think we should move to higher productivity, uh, more productivity, higher skill environment, but actually how we get there is going to be problematic. So I think actually resolving the issue between the tension between generalist and specialist, I think is particularly important. And thinking about places as ecosystems where people will cooperate one, one with another to provide pathways that lead from lower level skills to higher level skills in a way that's accessible and affordable seems to me what we, we will be looking to do over the next 10 years. And somebody, you know, 
apropos nothing else, he had asked me about the Auger report. Put up the there. I think the Auger report is alive and well and kicking and will be important in the next 10 years. Uh, I don't see any move from the consensus around the need to rebalance the system toward places, people, and different types of skills. So I, I to answer it, Jed, I, 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 I did my best. Come back on this point of immigration as well. But uh, we've got a question here and then a question at the back. Hello, Jeff Draper. I'm uh, ex-Army, so I have to declare my hand now. I, I did wake up at my uh, references there um, to, to my former studies as well. Going back to that, can I suggest that we have 80% of looking at the intent and the strategy, which we haven't got right, yet we use the funding to actually manipulate that intent and strategy through the operational element of the delivery components through the colleges? And as a result of which, are you as confident, I'm not, I'll declare my hand now, that we are going to get the funding and therefore the delivery mechanisms right when we actually are focusing on moving the deck chairs on the Titanic rather than looking at the intent and the strategy and forming in funding policies around that rather than the operational side? I think there are two contrary tensions here. I mean, it's all about contrary tensions and dilemmas, isn't it? it I, I think unless we resolve those tensions, then we will begin to, we'll just fall, f stumble forward as we've stumbled forward in the past. What I think argues for greater stability is the obvious point, we have a government for five years. We have the author of the Auger Report substantially as the Prime Minister's special advisor. We have a series of people that are now in, in government who've now, they're colours to the mast around this area. And I don't think there's any countervailing political view from the opposition, insofar as the opposition matters presently at the start of a five-year government. So I, I think the sense and direction of policy is fairly established. But where I see difficulties is when policymakers begin to meet policy in detail and begin to become disconnected from the overall direction. And I think that's something that's bedeviled policy making for, for any amount of time. Michael Hesitine said, we don't do detail very well in our policy making. Well, I think we don't do policy very well because we don't remember the intent behind the policy that we're writing. We get immersed in the detail and the action and counter reaction to something going wrong or some scandal or someone spending their expenses on the wrong thing or individual learning accounts having a 10% abuse rate, meaning that the whole of the program's f tossed away. So I think I am optimistic because we've got a five-year government. I am optimistic by some of the things they're saying, and I don't make that in a party political sense at all. And the emphasis has been placed on further education and skills, which actually is reinforced by the contextual circumstances of left-behind places and Brexit and all else. What I am not absolutely convinced about is people can combine that with the OODA loop and the detail of how you make policy and how you learn without always throwing out things that don't work the first time or don't work precisely as you intend. So yeah, I'm broadly optimistic, I think. We had a question back here. John Mandelasco, I'm the Chief Executive at Nottingham College. Um, the picture that you've just painted of FE is one that we would all recognise, the complexity, the challenges, and so on. I guess if we go back to the intent, the, the question that's puzzled me since I've got into the world of FE is why we continue to perpetuate a siloed mentality rather than a system-wide approach. So we continue to look at FE and we forget, we ignore, we're jealous of, or we argue with the two other ends of the spectrum in terms of our schools and our university provision. And I can't for the life of me understand why, from a policy perspective, we do not look at this whole system on an end-to-end -end basis and look for the optimum delivery of outcomes for our relative students at the various levels of progression that they may achieve. And I, I haven't heard in the whole time I've been in FE um, any movement 
on a policy-wide basis to address that fundamental issue? I wouldn't mind a perspective, please. Uh, John, I think I agree your observation, but I don't think that the, the, the answer is as simple as the question implies. Um, I didn't make a great deal of this, but I, I, the, the Newcastle study tells me, what does it tell me? It tells me this is a complex system. It reinforces your point. There are many inf interrelationships. But trying to simplify that and do an end-to-end -end process will by its nature be impossible to achieve because it will try and put, re reduce that simplicity or reduce that complexity down to a type of simplicity which would result in an authoritarian system. The only way you could have clear role differentiation between schools, universities and colleges if that was directed. If the only way you could have students who would behave as you'd want them to behave and as Amanda Spielman would expect them to behave was as if you, as in the German system, would direct some would go to a technical route and some would go to a academic route from age 11 and the system would act accordingly. It would be a simpler, more simple, more orderly, more balanced and end-to-end -end system, but it would be inimicable to our history and the way in which society operates in this country. Now that said, that's why I went into some detail about what would underwrite collaboration as well as competition. How you can have a market, but a market that's managed for the benefit of all rather than just the individual players within it. So I think we need to think through very carefully about how we would work, in which I much more prefer when you talk about complex systems to think about it as an ecosystem, something that's organic, that can't be sat on from a to on top of it and controlled in detail to put everyone in the, their place and everyone does what they're meant to do, like a factory process, but much more like something that grows organically, that you actually manage as it, it develops and people work together in order to get the best from it. And I think that's, that organic model is much more consonant with the shape of a modern economy and how it will behave and move in the 21st century. So I accept I would like greater role differentiation, which is why I like the Scottish system better. It's emerged. Uh, but we are where we are here with different histories and different parts of the country. And I think that we, we will not go f back to an authoritarian system. So we've got to try and think how we work through to make the links, as you do in Nottingham with your schools, as you do with your universities, how you begin to work out what you do and what you do best and how you can best serve your community and actually have trusted partners who you can rely on to do similarly. So uh, Paul Collier talks about this a lot in the crisis of cap capitalism. And he falls back on ethical behavior. Now, it's, it's perhaps too woolly, but I think we all need to think through why we do things and what we do and how it relates to others. And I'd much rather have that the case than somebody telling me what to do and tem telling me how to do it and putting me in a box. Is that really the only alternative, though? I mean, there, there are other models. There are plenty of other educational systems one can point to, and there are some which do embrace flexibility. There, do, there are others that embrace this sort of hybrid relationship between the market, the state, and society. We can talk about, for example, US community colleges, where you can go and you can get, if you like, a trade level qualification, or you can nonetheless acquire credits, which will enable you to transfer either to a state university system or a private university system. Um, they allow you to build up a portfolio of, of credits. Um, I mean, there, there are other models of flexibility. I, I'm wondering if we're just getting caught no, up I in the dualism I here. Say that. I mean, the, the sense of the whole thing to this evening was there's a market over here, red in tooth and claw, then there's a directed system over here. Yep. We fall, and we'll always fall somewhere in between the two on the continuum. And in this, in, you know, the four nations were spread across the continuum. In Scotland, there is colleges are not incorporated in the same way as community colleges are incorporated in, not independent in the same way. But actually, they exhibit high levels of entrepreneurial behavior within the system and have been granted a degree of autonomy within that system. It's less than here, but it still exists. The difficulty with transferring from Scotland to here, about scale, separation, and geography, 
and other considerations. But yes, I think we will see a greater measure of control. What I'm only concerned about is when we move to devolution, we do move further out to the directed economy because people are closer to actually the points of control. So yeah, it's, it's, it's in that bit, Brad, you're absolutely right. It's between those two poles and what settlement we arrive at there. But inherently it will involve, involve a degree of collaboration and competition because the, it's a mixed market. So actually thinking our way through what's the best settlement in that it seems important to me. I, I think autonomy of colleges in England will probably be more ascribed going forward. Um, but ascribing that autonomy while, we're, while still retaining a degree of enterprise and entrepreneurial behaviour is, is difficult to achieve. There were other questions I saw. We've got one. Ruth, there. Um, uh, reading size and rumours is a great pastime of uh, both of us, I think, Martin, and I, and and both right now in this time of new government, the size and rumours are both on the left and the right of politics, that um, the uh, uh, that, that move to adult education may well be the forerunner of taking colleges back into their local authorities so that the partnership is endorsed, enabled, and so on. How do you view that? Apart from your mouth falling out. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I'm just trying to think about it, because I'm I've, in te integrity, the whole presentation is on the one hand and on the other, all right? So I, I have no difficulty whatever. In fact, I'd be enthusiastic. I'd, I'm, I'm a convert around this. I'd, I'd, I'd be believing in mayors and combined authorities, so long as they have the capability, capacity, in order to exercise a role, having a closer relationship with their colleges and, and providers within their geographical areas. Where I fear is that there will be a return to behavior that previously existed with local authorities prior to incorporation. In a simpler world where those local authorities did exercise much tighter control in some places in the country than actually was the case post-incorporation. So provided that the new inheritors, if you like, of colleges and other providers act in a way which is consistent with the way in which the economy and these types of environments now change so quickly by not seeking to control in detail but actually be giving a conceptual framework for people to operate and trusting them to operate within that framework through a set of trusted providers, then I'm, I think that's a good thing. It brings it closer to the place. But I'd, perhaps in a, 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 the shorthand way I did it, I, I think there are significant practical difficulties of achieving that in England. And it is an England issue. Without being grossly mis over simplifying this, Scotland, Paul, please, Forgive me for this, this is gross over simplification. It's got Aberdeen up there, it's got Edinburgh at one end of the Fourth Valley, it's got Glasgow at the other end, and it's got a bit in between, which Fourth Valley does, and it's got the Highlands and Islands. Geographically, it's relatively easy to separate those colleges and align them with particular authorities. It's much harder to do that with the M6 corridor and who belongs to what, which college belongs to who, and how do they operate. And there's a, there are great big gaping holes between the combined authorities in England that don't belong to anybody, that are run by LEPs, that don't seem to me have the capacity or capability to exercise that role effectively. So I don't think it's an either or between national and local, and, but if, it, if the rebalancing is more towards the local, then I'm supportive of it as long as local authorities behave in a manner which is consistent with, what that, with that which they're trying to procure, which is inherently complex, fast moving and requiring the degree of responsiveness that detailed control won't reward. So, um, Jay, and then we've got some of the back. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I'm f you'll know how pleased I am to have seen another picture of Clausewitz uh, in the Institute of Education, which I think is nicely disruptive. Um, a serious point, though. Um, you haven't, you didn't say very much at all uh, about teaching and learning. And I wonder whether that, that might be something you could say something about. In 
as much as, um, for me, one of the issues about further education and other sectors too at the moment is this will towards standardization, um, which we see in respect of um, questions asked all the time in policy about what works, the idea being that there is something that works and everybody should be doing it, um, and also the Ofsted um, regime, which is something which tends towards standardization, rightly or wrongly. Could you say something, a few words about that in terms of the kind of tensions and dilemmas that you mentioned earlier? Thank you. Um, Hi, my name is Nana. I'm from Kingston College. Um, as an aspiring senior leader in FE, um, I think from your presentation, I need the skills of a fighter jet pilot, dominant Cummins, world-renowned economists, etc. I'm just wondering, um, what skill sets do you think that senior leaders would need to navigate this turbulent, chaotic, complex system that you've described? And do you genuinely believe that these leaders will be able to enact self-agency as working in FE in various managerial roles and um, executive roles? I've found that actually I am just a puppet to government policies. Tom Buick, Federation of Warning Bodies. Martin, thank you as ever for uh, a really stimulating and thoughtful uh, lecture. You referenced um, in your presentation uh, Thaler and Sunstein and, and, and their 2008 book, Nudge. And uh, one of the uh, phrases that I remember from that book was the idea of um, uh, libertarian paternalism, which to some might sound like an oxymoron, but I just wondered to what extent, in terms of the current reform path for FE, you thought that terminology was useful uh, in terms of direction of travel. And just sort of find, just to add on, given that we've just got an FE skills and apprenticeship minister back after a, a vacuum. The schools and universities uh, sector kept their ministers. Uh, we've just got one back in uh, sanctuary buildings. If there's one point from your presentation this evening you want to really underline for the new minister, what would it be? Uh, take the last one first, if I can, because I've got to think about the other ones. Um, <laughs> li libertarian paternalism, when they're Fahler and Fun Sunstein talk about it, most of all, it's about choice architecture and s guiding people into doing the right things. I'm, I'm less comfortable with the paternalism than I am the libertarianism in it, but the term that Paul Collier uses is libertarian maternalism, but uh, actually seems better to me. Um, I don't know why. Perhaps I'm being, I've become all PC late, late in my career. Um, but I think the sense of what they're talking about is that you construct an architecture which allows people to make choices which actually o have overall benefit to society seems right to me. So yes, I think it is the right approach, which is consistent with my robust framework and then actually nudge within that overall framework. So yes, it is about having an architecture which enables choice and people exercise choice within that architecture. If I was going to say to the, the FE minister is think hard before you change things about what you're seeking to achieve and when you embark on it, embark on it with due humility that it won't turn out precisely the way you expect and have a bit of patience to see it through until it settles and learn as a policy develops. Uh, so despite the, the lobbying of the Association of Colleges, me, you, and other people, hold true to your principles and what you want to achieve and only change in micro ways the system rather than the overall direction of travel. But think very hard and long about what the direction of travel should be before you embark upon it. No, no, what a great question. I, I, I'm going to be really lazy and say you should have come to my first lecture because it was all about that. And fundamentally, the, the leadership behavior I think that's most important to give you agency is to ask, why am I doing this? And what am I seeking to achieve? And the attendant question, what I think is enormously important, is being understanding what you won't do. People are all too often driven by the funding sources to do anything to actually generate an income stream. I think we need to be discerning enough to say there's an income stream here which is of potential openly to me, but it's not for me. You know, this is not what we're about. This is not what I do well. 
and others can do this and ought to do this. So actually, it's, a, it's that sense of understanding why I'm going to do something, or the organization I'm in, why the organization I'm leading is doing something, and then deciding with some clarity about what's to be achieved, and being prepared to say some things are not for us. Uh, the whole lecture the first time talked about long-term direction of travel and terms of values as also, also, which hold you to a course of action. So I think that one of the most important things for a leader is to set that long-term long sense of direction, give people a sense of themselves, who they serve, and how they'll continue to serve them, and actually evaluate policy when it comes to you rather than just accepting it. Um, Jay, on standardization, it, it, you are right. And, and in sense of this thing tonight was one size fo won't fit all everywhere and at all times. And the sense of it also is that practitioners and leaders ought to be trusted at the point of delivery to make informed decisions about what works best for the audience that's before me or the students before me. I haven't talked much about teaching and learning elsewhere. And you know we've had con conversations. I, I do think we need to give much more attendant attention to pedagogy as opposed to applies particularly for me in my case to technical and professional education what makes it different and how we we proceed because so many of our assumptions are based on traditional academic study and we tend to borrow from academic learning rather than actually to invent our own ways of doing things or, d or derive our own ways of doing things that are best suited to our own environment and quite often Ofsted seeks to assess technical professional education or colleges meeting local needs based on academic presumptions that oversimplify what we do. Well, I think on that point, we have to close this uh, <coughs> truly stimulating uh, lecture and discussion. And just to invite you all to, to join us and should you have further questions, um, we're very fortunate we have some, some wine and refreshments. And uh, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>